Until now, the Japanese government promoted nuclear power as safe and environment friendly. Every year, the education ministry has spent almost $5 million on programs to spread the message. It was even included in the curriculum taught to students in elementary and middle schools. But the incident at the Fukushima plant is making teachers rethink what they teach about nuclear power. These supplementary readers provided by the government teach students about nuclear power. The books reassure students with claims like, these five walls protect the nuclear power plant, and they are built to withstand strong earthquakes or tsunamis. But the crisis at Fukushima shattered the widespread belief about the safety of nuclear power. People in education are looking for alternative information for teaching students about nuclear power. One local government decided to stop teaching children that it is essential to use nuclear power in Japan. In Toyohashi City, central Japan, the original plan had been to teach fourth grade students the value of nuclear power. An auxiliary reader explains that nuclear power is necessary to generate energy. But another nuclear power plant, this one in a nearby area, was shut down after the Fukushima crisis. Now people question whether nuclear power is necessary at all. The Toyohashi Board of Education distributed a handout to all elementary schools. It explains how to teach the information in the supplementary reader. The board wants a more impartial perspective, so it instructs teachers to omit the section that claims nuclear power is essential. Right now, Japanese people are not completely sure about the safety of nuclear power, so schools find they can't help being influenced by this outlook. Meanwhile, another elementary school is trying to come to grips with the issue. The school in Iwaki City lies about 50 kilometers from the Daiichi plant. Until recently, the school taught students about energy sources, including nuclear power. Every year, the sixth graders used to take a field trip to the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, as it was an important industry in the area. But the accident at the TEPCO plant shocked the teachers. They are still discussing what to teach their students about nuclear power. Teachers shouldn't hide anything from the students. We must give a thorough explanation of the causes and background of everything that happened during the crisis. The school has started a program to make students fully understand what is happening around them. Twice a day, the students take turns measuring radiation levels in the schoolyard. On this day, the radiation is much lower than the government-sanctioned safety level. Afterward, a teacher encourages the students to think about how to deal with the readings. So, what should we do? Just like before, even if radiation levels are low, we have to wash our hands and gargle, and we shouldn't spend too much time outdoors during the summer vacation. There's so much information about nuclear power. We try to teach our students to pick out the correct information and use it effectively. We hope our students will be able to evaluate whether nuclear power is necessary for Japan. Though the nuclear crisis is not yet over, the education ministry is waiting for the government to revise its policies on nuclear energy. Based on these policies, the ministry says it will review school curriculums about nuclear power. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission meets this morning to discuss sweeping new safety recommendations. Now, the agency just finished inspecting all 104 U.S. nuclear plants in the wake of Japan's Fukushima disaster. CBS News Chief Investigative Correspondent Armin Katayan is here to tell us what he found at one of those facilities in Tennessee. Armin, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Rebecca. We decided to take a look at the NRC's post-Fukushima inspection, inspection report at Watts Bar. It's the last nuclear plant to be licensed in the U.S. in a textbook study of the pros and cons of nuclear power, providing electricity to some 9 million people in seven states, yet 
dogged with a long history of safety issues and whistleblower lawsuits, including six by a 71-year-old great-grandmother named Ann Harris. Good morning, Ann. Hi. I'm Armin. How are you? Walk through the front door of Ann Harris's house in rural Tennessee. Stir that for me. Sure. And you'll meet one of the most unlikely and feared advocates for nuclear safety. I began as a, a clerk in uh, instrumentation engineering at Watts Bar in construction on Unit 1. And um, I could barely spell nuclear when I went to work. What's the turning point for you? Basically, the books are being cooked. People are saying things are not being, they swear under oath that it's been done and it hadn't been done. When Harris refused to sign a multi-million dollar construction contract riddled with errors, she says Tennessee Valley Authority executives told her her career was over. Instead, it sparked a 28-year crusade devoted to preventing a nuclear accident. You can see a Fukushima happening here in the U.S. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. CBS News has obtained a copy of this NRC post-Fukushima Watts Bar report dated May 2011. We had two nuclear engineers look at the report. One gave Watts Bar a D- and called it appalling. The other cited what he called more than 40 disturbing findings during a 40-hour inspection, including a lack of emergency responder training, faulty control panels, malfunctioning communications equipment, and issues with portable backup diesel generators. Why isn't the NRC pounding on the door of Watts Bar saying, look, we need these problems fixed? I think the fact that there hasn't been a major reactor accident in the United States for over three decades allows the industry and the NRC to become complacent. And are they just gambling, taking one huge risk with people's lives with these reactors, particularly Watts Bar? Well, in some respects, it's the biggest poker game in the, in the country. You're playing high-stakes poker with American lives. Well, I think that's absurd. Bill McCollum, chief operating officer of the TVA, says the NRC's findings are far outweighed by safeguards built in to Watts Bar. We're certainly going to take those seriously, correct those issues, and then even beyond that, our own reviews of the events in Japan have shown us that we have opportunities to bring in additional backup equipment that will make our response even more robust. Tucked into the foothills of eastern Tennessee, Watts Bar took 23 years to build at a cost of nearly eight billion dollars. It was shut down in the mid-1980s over an avalanche of safety issues. In 1986, this independent report alone documented more than 5,000 concerns. Roger Hanna is a top spokesman for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The NRC treats every single allegation very seriously. It doesn't matter what the source, it doesn't matter what the subject. We look at it, we screen those allegations. Uh, we have done that for years. We, all the allegations that were provided over the years at Watts Bar have been addressed in one way or another. If we had doubts about the ability of TVA to operate the Watts Bar plant safely, we would not allow that plant to operate. You'd shut it down? Absolutely. So that's the scheme. To that end, TVA executives gave us an extensive tour of Watts Bar's reactor and its twin, Watts Bar 2, scheduled to go online next fall. These are a part of our emergency backup in case we lose off-site power. They showed us these diesel-powered generators, one of four critical backup systems to keep water flowing to the reactor, preventing a meltdown. That is the reactor head. The reactor head. The vessel is actually down in this pit here. And here's the main control room, said to be able to shut down the reactor in less than three seconds. At TVA, every five weeks, every operator goes through a week of training. You'll have to pardon Ann Harris if she's heard it all before. She's won a record six whistleblower lawsuits against Watts Bar over issues like millions of feet of faulty electrical cable and says she's paid a price for speaking out. There has certainly been attempts at intimidation, recrimination, and, and really threats on your life. Yes. They ran me off the road. They uh, wired my car for firebombing. Uh, they dropped the uh, universal joint out of my car. Harris left the TVA in 1997, but says she's still taking late-night calls from whistleblowers, still driven to hold the TVA and NRC accountable, standing square in the crosshairs of the nuclear power debate. And tomorrow in part two of our report, we'll take a close look, a very close look, at the culture war at Watts Bar.
Wow, uh, incredible to hear her stories there too. Yeah, the end, she's a remarkable woman. Uh, let's talk about the NRC's Japan Task Force. What were their main recommendations? Well, Chris, they really came up with 12, and they're talking about strengthening what they say are the in-depth measures to the plant. In essence, if there is a Fukushima-style disaster, uh, if the station blackout, if there is some seismic event, if there's a problem with the fuel rods, in the past they have been patchwork. Yeah. And what they really want now, they call is a logical, systematic, coherent set of regulations. Yeah. And what do you think the nuclear industry's reaction to that is going to be? Not good. Yeah. I, think, I don't think it's going to be welcomed at all with open arms. Um, what they are saying is, is these are very big ticket items and they're going to be expensive to, to produce. But um, I think the NRC wants to show they're just not in bed with uh, you know, people like the TVA and the industry. And as far as what happens next, especially with this plant? Well, they're going to have these here. Um, the uh, NRC has five members. They're going to vote. Um, it could take them up to one to two to ten years to put these in place, but that vote could come within 90 days. All right. CBS's Armin Katane. Marvin, thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.